Hello, everyone. I hope you're all having a good day. Let me start my presentation with this quote. I'll let you read it. I think the quote is a very good reminder that if we are to understand how to engage with technology, we need to understand how to engage with people. So I want us to take a step back and not to worry about the specific hardware or software, but to think about how can technology allow us to be the best versions of ourselves. And I have been exploring this question in relation to personalization. I'll talk about the 21st century, possibly an era of personalization. Then I'll move to personalized education and some of the research that has been done in this area. And I'll finish with some recommendations in terms of personalized pluralization. So first, the question of the era of personalization. Well, it is certainly a popular view that today's generation of children and young people are the so-called me, 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 me generation, or the selfie generation, or the self-absorbed uh, generation only interested in themselves. There are several popular books and articles that ponder to this view. There are also many popular personalized products some of them more successful than others. Now, children love to see themselves reflected in the products they use. They like to see that there is a product made uniquely for them, with their own name, with their own appearance. And these products are not only in clothing, in school materials, they're also in the books that young children use, and they are certainly in many apps and digital products. Now, these are examples of static personalization, where we take some personal information about the child, such as their name, date of birth, gender, and we embed it into a one-off product. But things change if we use this personal information in a dynamic way. We adapt the product as the child is using it. And this is a step change, because whereas you had before the possibilities to use personal information to indicate ownership of a product. Nowadays, you're using personalization to change behavior and perception of a product. And you would be familiar with personalized news, personalized advertising, personalized recommendations, and as you may have heard, um, the big technology giants, the Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple are giants because they harness personal information to deliver bespoke products. So the question I'm asking is, how much is this attention 
on an individual pushing the boundaries of a collective society. Because one could argue that the 21st century is more in this um, left box, focused on personalization, individualism, self-centeredness. Well, we certainly favor and prioritize personalized technologies, but whether the entire century can be described as personalized, I think is a question that needs to be answered in a specific context. So the context we are all most familiar with is education and schools. So let me now zoom in from this broader overview to personalized education. So here we are seeing two opposing trajectories. In business, personalization is moving from online to offline. From personalized recommendations and emails, we are moving to personalized Internet of Toys, Internet of Things, personal shopping assistance. In education, we are moving from face-to-face -face personalized education delivered by teachers to online personalized pathways. And the questions that are being asked in business are very specific about where and how to introduce personalization. You know, if I um, make a purchase, um, I buy a perfume bottle, I might receive an email at the beginning of the purchasing process, like, um, hey, Natalia, would you like to buy this Hugo Boss uh, perfume because you bought something similar before? Or I might get it at the end. Thank you for shopping with us, Natalia. Here is a specific voucher for the next purchase. But in education, we are asking whether personalized education is even desirable. Is this something we want or not? Why? Well, because personalized education is only one side of the coin. If we want to have holistic education, we need to combine personalization with pluralization. We need to have ingredients from these two bottles, if you like. And this is where I move to personalized pluralization, which is so hard to pronounce. Um, what it means is that we need to have a balance between these two sets of values. There are two components that work together. If we are to be the best versions of ourselves to other people, as well as to the unique self, we really need to combine skillfully and carefully these two sets of values. If we don't do that, we run into significant problems, myths and mistaken assumptions. And um, I'll take you through two of them, separation and sequence. So the separation myth is quite simple. It essentially says that you can separate personalized education and standardized education, and you can still have a holistic education system. And the sequence myth builds on this separation myth, because it assumes that if you can separate personalization and pluralization, then you can have first one and then the other, or vice versa. And when it's taken to extreme, then in many education systems, you start with first giving children choices. 
So in kindergartens, very often children have free play. There is a lot of attention on the individual child. Then as you move to primary, it's getting a bit, um, you know, smaller, and there is more of a push to comply with standardized curriculum. It is very much in the other side of standardization in secondary. And then at university level, the pendulum swings back and we give students lots of choices, uh, many pathways, many courses they can choose from. Now, this doesn't always work because it is not aligned with what we know from research that works for motivation and the choices that we offer to children, as well as adult learners. You cannot be motivated only by your own choices. You need to be offered choices that also motivate the wider society. And it shouldn't be the case that choice is offered only at the beginning of the learning process to motivate learners and then is abandoned. Personalization needs to work for all ages and at all stages of the learning process. And the problem with the separation myth um, is that it actually goes against the psychological principles of learning. You may be familiar with the term cognitive challenge. It essentially means that so that students, children, remember information and apply it to their own lives, they need to be learning through cognitive challenges. And this means that the learning content cannot be just things they like and prefer. There's this saying, um, no pain, no gain. And this is very much about cognitive challenges. So motivation and engagement, that is very, very important. But it's only the beginning of the learning process. Teachers need to motivate young students, but then offer them these challenges so that the learning sticks, is remembered and applied. Now, for those of you who design technologies, you must be thinking that this is a bit um, crazy or um, zany, <laughs> because if Amazon took my ideas and they uh, offered me a book, uh, sending me a message saying, um, hey, Natalia, this is a book you will not like. Uh, you didn't buy this before, and none of your friends like it. Uh, but we still think you should buy it. Um, that wouldn't work. Um, but this is precisely why we cannot take a business model and apply it to education, expecting learning benefits. We really need to think hard about the algorithms that are being used to personalize specific learning content. These algorithms need to adapt to the individual child, but at the same time, they need to diversify the content the child is receiving based on data from the classroom environment, from what the teacher supplies. That is the principle of democratic classrooms, that we combine personalization and pluralization. It is not unachievable. This is something that can be done. And in fact, a lot of um, technologies that use the principles of universal design, so those that accommodate all learners, the top achievers, the lower performing students, as well as the average learner, those are the technologies we want to see. 
Universal design started in uh, architecture, uh, then uh, in Japan, 1980s in Japan, it was in the toy industry, and it's increasingly moving into educational technology, so hopefully there'll be um, more of that in the future. So, those were um, perhaps some heavy ideas, so let me just um, summarize them. First message I would like you to remember, whatever your position, whether you see yourselves predominantly as a teacher, designer, technology provider, parent, librarian, politician, it's very important that we remember this balance, that personalized education combined with standardized education offers the most challenging and therefore the most rewarding experience for children. We really need both sides to ensure that they learn and that the learning sticks. It shouldn't be the case that personalized education is perceived or offered as superior to any other education. It is not. It needs to work together with what we had before. In terms of personalized education, the research is clear. Personalized education needs to be offered at all stages of learning for all age groups and all learners. It shouldn't be just children with specific needs or very talented children or young or old. We all like to be motivated by personally engaging content. So if we are to offer personalized education, then it needs to work for everyone. And the last uh, most difficult question, and, uh, you know, do we live in an era of personalization? Is the 21st century an era of personalization? Well, you would be familiar with this quote. Life is about change, and no change happens in a vacuum. We are all change makers, teachers, educators, technology designers. So we all decide how much gets changed in our own contexts. Um, I hope that uh, when the 21st century is described in the history books, it is described as a century where uh, we all made a change to ensure that it is about us, as well as the me, myself, and I. That's it from me. Thank you for listening. And thank you for talking to us, Natalia. Um, and thank you for connecting research and practice in such an intelligent way. You talk about the, the me generation, of course, but you also give us really good advice as educators. I think most of us are parents in here. What about that me generation? What is your advice to us as parents? Yes, um, well, parents are um, very important role models and change makers as well. <laughs> So, um, I suppose on a very practical level, um, I see so many parents taking pictures of their own children all the time, and, and it's lovely. Um, but I often encourage them to think about the use of technology to connect to others as well. So, perhaps take a picture of your child, as well as of the family, Perhaps um, give the phone to your child to take a picture of you, and then you can have a conversation about it. Um, so really having that P and P balance at the back of our minds, yeah. So promoting the mentality of us instead of me, me, me. To balance it up. Yeah, <laughs> yes. exactly. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank give you. a hand.